have time for a guitar solo, I guess not. Oh, man. There were two, 243. I didn't think I was going to have any musicians tonight. We've got a whole stage full here. 243, the Lily of the Valley. Number 138. 
for our last one, number 130. 130. <clears throat> I believe the uh, Cordelia, do you have our special music? No? Okay.
I need one. If you want to turn in your Bibles tonight to Numbers chapter 35, Numbers chapter 35, and, and to really get into uh, to understanding the impacts of the text, we really have to remind ourselves of the group of people and um, what they had come from, what they were going into. And you might say their lack of, of structure and organization as far as a civilization. So remember we're talking about the children of Israel. They had been uh, slaves in Egypt for many years. And then Moses leads them out. They get to the edge of the promised land. They goof that up and then they wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And then God finally brings them into uh, the promised land. Moses dies. Joshua leads them in. But we find a group of people that are really trying to learn how to live civilization-wise. So as Israelites, they were, God was having to inform them of a societal structure and laws and things to put in place in order for them to function as a group of people that could live together. So we find in chapter 35, one of the things that that um, God gives them in order to keep order within their cities and their communities. Now, this happens to be concerning murder, but it's a wonderful reminder uh, for us of what Christ actually does in our life. So when we look at chapter 35, and we find this talk of a city of refuge, remember that we find refuge today spiritually in Jesus Christ. That is the only place we can really find refuge. There's a lot of places we can go and, and seek counsel and maybe get advice. But when we talk about refuge, Christ is the only place we can find this. When you look at the, the children of Israel, they were broken into 12 tribes, one of those tribes being the tribe of Levi. Out of the tribe of Levi came all of the priests that existed. The priests were not allowed to own land. And so they were um, living in what was 48 cities in the Promised Land. Out of those 48 cities, six of those ended up being um, cities of refuge. Three of them were on the east side of the Jordan, the other three were on the west, and they were spread out in the Promised Land so that there wasn't a distance that was too great for an individual to travel to one of those cities of refuge. Now the purpose of the cities of refuge was to actually allow a place for someone who had um, someone who had committed manslaughter to be able to seek refuge until he had his trial and they figure out what they're going to do. So the way this would go, and, and keep in mind there's a difference between murder and manslaughter. Murder is an intention that I want to kill someone and I'm going to act on it. It's premeditated. When you think about manslaughter, manslaughter can be an accidental type death. The Scripture actually identifies, I uh, think, about three different ways that that could occur here. But if you get into Deuteronomy, you find other ways that is mentioned that that accidental uh, manslaughter could happen. Here it's identified as, as the hurling of a stone, and it happens to strike someone and it kills them. So we'll see that as we read through. But in these... Um, in this accidental manslaughter, manslaughter, you find that once an individual committed that, they could flee to one of these refuge cities. And as long as they get to the city before the avenger actually gets to them, and the people at the gates say, yes, you can come in, then they could find refuge within the city until their trial happened. 
And we'll talk through a little more of that in a moment. But if the individual was caught on the road on the way to the city by the avenger, then the avenger could actually uh, avenge the death of his kinsman, and there was no questions asked at that point in time. So, seems a little odd for us standing on this side of the cross and this side of, of Christ paying our debt and us finding atonement for our sin in Him. It seems a little bit odd as we look back to Old Testament and we see this type of a law. But it is what God was putting in place for two things, at least two things. One is to establish order within this society that was being created. Secondly, it was to point them to their need eventually for a place that they could find forgiveness of sin, and that being through Jesus Christ. So let's read starting in verse 1 of chapter 35, and then we'll share some things as we go through. Verse 1, The Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan at Jericho, saying, Command the people of Israel to give to the Levites some of the inheritance of their possession as cities for them to dwell in. Now keep in mind, the Levites didn't own the cities. They were just allowed to live there. So it wasn't a possession they had. It was a place for them to live. And you shall give to the Levites pasture lands around the cities. The cities shall be theirs to dwell in, and their pasture lands shall be for their cattle, and for their livestock, and for all their beasts. Now that cattle, livestock, and beasts would be offerings that people would bring to the priest in order to sustain them. That was how the priest actually existed, is through the offerings that came in through the temple, or part of the way that they existed. The pasture lands of the city, verse 4, pasture lands of the cities which you shall give to the Levites shall reach from the wall of the city outward a thousand cubits all around, and you shall measure outside the city and on the east side two thousand cubits, and on the south side two thousand cubits, and on the west side two thousand cubits, and on the north side two thousand cubits. The city being in the middle, this shall belong to them as pasture land for their cities. The cities that you give to the Levites shall be the six cities of refuge, where you shall permit the manslayer to flee, and in addition to them you shall give forty-two cities. So forty-eight in all, six of them were to be these refuge cities. And again, they were scattered throughout the Promised Land so that there wasn't too great of a distance. Someone could make it to them if they needed to. Verse 7, All the cities that you give to the Levites shall be forty-eight with their pasture lands. And as for the cities that you shall give from the possession of the people of Israel, from the larger tribes you shall take many, and from the smaller tribes you shall take few, each in proportion to the inheritance that it inherits, shall give of its cities to the Levites. Verse 9, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people, of Israel, and say to them, When you cross the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall select cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the manslayer who kills any person without intent may flee there. So, manslayer being the one that committed manslaughter. Verse 12, The city shall be for you a refuge from the avenger that the manslayer may not die until he stands before the congregation for judgment. And the cities that you shall give, and the cities that you give, shall be your six cities of refuge. You shall give three cities beyond the Jordan and three cities in the land of Canaan, to be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be for refuge for the people of Israel, and for the stranger and for the sojourner among them, that anyone who kills any person without intent may flee there. It is interesting, I want to stop for a moment. We see this word sojourner that shows up throughout the text as we look in these Old Testament passages. And this sojourner was an individual who was not an Israelite, but maybe someone who was passing through, someone from a surrounding tribe of people. But it seems as though God is always telling them to provide for the sojourner or let the sojourner stay with him. Now there were specific rules about where they could stay, where they could not stay. But at the same time they were to be allowed to be there. God was reminding them that when they were in Egypt they sojourned in the land as well. And God had provided for them the entire time that they was in Egypt. 
And so he's reminding them of what he done for them, and they were now to express that to the people that would sojourn among them. It was a reminder of God's goodness, and it was a reminder that they were to be the light to the people around them. So here he provides these refuge cities to also be for that sojourner as well. Verse 16, But if he struck him down with an iron object so that he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. And if he struck him down with a stone tool that could cause death and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. Notice the difference between murderer and someone that commits manslaughter or a manslayer. Verse 18, Or if he struck him down with a wooden tool that could cause death, and he died, he is a murderer. The murderer shall be put to death. The avenger of blood shall himself be the murderer to death. When he meets him, he shall put him to death. And if he pushed him out of hatred, or hurled something at him, lying in wait so that he died, or in enmity struck him down with his hand so that he died, then he who struck the blow shall be put to death. He is a murderer. The avenger of blood shall put the murderer to death when he meets him. Now, you read this passage and you see what the avenger is supposed to do. And if you want to kind of get questioning what God's doing here, you could say, well, why is the avenger not a murderer also? So why is the avenger not a murderer also? Eye for an eye. Does that make him not a murderer? Well, is it? Okay. So, so that means if someone hits me in the eye, since he hit me in the eye, I can hit him back in the eye, right? You turn the other cheek and let him hit the other eye. Do what? Then you hit him both. Then you hit him both. Y'all are getting way away from, I think, what God would want us to know here tonight. I'm sorry, don't we? He's the injured party, is that what you said? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so the condition of the heart, possibly. Someone else said something. Well. You also have all the time to think about this person just killed your brother or your dad or whoever it might be. So it could go either ways. They were on the other side of the cross, so we didn't have Holy Spirit living in them at this point in time. So it would have been through a, high, through a priest that they would have had to have this conversation with God, theoretically. Yeah, now we're getting to somewhere. Righteous murder. There has to be an atonement for the taking of a life. God values human life so much that there has to be a consequence when a human life is taken. And so, in this situation, and again, the condition of the heart on the avenger should have been right. We can't say that it always was, but the condition of the heart should have been. That he was fulfilling what God had ordered or ordained for him to do. When someone was murdered, there had to be a payment. Now, we think about that today, and we think about sin in general. And when we look at Christ and we see what he did upon the cross for us, we understand that our sin requires some type of a payment. We reference it sometimes that we had a debt of sin that we could not pay something that we could not work hard enough in order for that debt to be gone. We think about our world as society is established today, and if you go and you purchase a car or land or a house or whatever it may be, you go indebted, but there's an end date typically 
It seems like it's way out there, but there's an end date typically in order to get out of that debt. You continue to make payments, and finally that debt is gone. In the case of sin against God, our unrighteousness, there was no way for us to pay that debt off because our unrighteousness continued on. Our sinfulness continued on. It never stopped. Never stops today except for the blood of Christ redeeming us. And so Christ was the sin payment, or I'm sorry, was the, the blood payment for our sin. When we look back to this, we find that, that God valued human life so much, something had to be done because the life had been taken. And there had to be a payment. Christ was not on the scene yet, so Christ's death on the cross would not fulfill this payment yet. And so we have the avenger that steps into play. And he is not committing this murder because in many cases he wanted to. you got to imagine that there were some of these avengers that really didn't want to go out and do that. And maybe they had had some time thinking about this and they wanted to be forgiving, but yet it was law. And if they were going to be right with the law, then they had to actually do this. We see God's righteousness on display. And His righteousness could not be overlooked. And therefore this had to take place. Look at verse 22 then. But if He pushed Him suddenly without enmity, or hurled anything on Him without lying in wait, or used a stone that could cause death, and without seeing Him dropped it on Him, so that He died... Though he was not his enemy and did not seek his harm, then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood in accordance with these rules. So, in other words, if there was an accidental death, I don't know necessarily how you drop a rock on somebody's head and not see them there, but, but that's what he spells out here. I guess when they're building buildings possibly, and they were setting rocks, and maybe a person walks by and a rock tumbles off the wall and hits them on the head. That's possibly what could have happened here. Verse 25, And the congregation shall rescue the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to his city of refuge to which he had fled. And he shall live in it until the death of the high priest who is anointed with the holy oil. So let's stop there for a moment. So Let's say that individual is, we're just going to use the situation of building a house with rock, rock falls off, hits somebody on the head, kills them. This individual now, according to law, the avenger could actually go after him. And so this individual that accidentally made the rock fall has to flee to a refuge city, one of these six. He has to get there pretty quick. So this is one of those cases where he doesn't go home and necessarily pack a suitcase because if the avenger catches him first, then he could be killed and nothing would be said at that moment in time. So he flees to the city. At that point then there is somewhat of a court case that, that is held. Typically it was right outside of the refuge city so that the the murderer, if you, or the, uh, the manslayer did not have to go very far, and he would be close to the city of refuge. The congregation would decide. We read down in just a moment. It's not on the testimony of one witness, but it was on the testimony of more than one. But they would decide what would happen with the manslayer. If they found him guilty, then the avenger would actually uh, put him to death or kill him. If he was found innocent, he still had to go back into the city of refuge or else the avenger could still kill him. And so he goes back into the city of refuge. He had to live in the city of refuge until the high priest actually died. At that point then he was free to go and the avenger could do nothing at that point in time. Now why was this high priest's death so instrumental for this manslayer to be able to leave after the high priest dies. He paid the debt. There was blood that had been shed at that point in time. The high priest then, remember, is the, he is the go-between between mankind and God at that point in time. He wasn't perfect, but he was the communicator. He had to die 
a physical death, but He didn't die for all mankind. He died for His death would satisfy the payment that was needed for the manslayers that were living within that refuge city. And therefore they could then leave the refuge city and go back into their normal life at that point in time. Yes. Yeah, so it would be all who were there. So if you were a manslayer, you probably hoped that the priest was getting on up in years because you wouldn't have to live there that long, hopefully, at that point. But until he died, they were, they were to live there. If they left, then their life was in the avenger's hands at that point in time. Is that all clear as mud so far? A little bit different. Yeah, a little bit different context, though. Uh, we're dealing with righteousness here. That's not so much what we're dealing with there. Yeah. All right, where did I get to? Um, verse 26, I think. But if the manslayer shall at any time go beyond the boundaries of his city of refuge to which he fled, and the avenger of blood finds him outside the boundaries of this city of refuge, and the avenger of blood kills the manslayer, he shall not be guilty of blood. In other words, it's fine for him to kill him if he steps outside of that city of refuge. For he must remain in his city of refuge until the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the manslayer may return to the land of his possession. And these things shall be a statute and a rule for you throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. Verse 30, If anyone kills a person, the murderer shall be put to death on evidence of witnesses. But no person shall be put to death on the testimony of one witness. Moreover, you shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be put to death. Why could they not accept a ransom? We know what a ransom is, right? You take a thousand dollars to somebody and then you're not guilty anymore. Yeah. Why could they not accept it? I'm sorry. Payment had to be blood. It could not be paid in anything else, which tells us that blood is more valuable than anything else in God's eyes, the life that was within. Verse 32, And you shall accept no ransom from, for him who has fled to his city of refuge, that he may return to dwell in the land before the death of the high priest. In other words, no matter how much someone tries to pay that is a manslayer, he can't return until that high priest dies. Verse 33, You shall not pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land. And no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of the one who shed it. You shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell. For I, the Lord, dwell in the midst of the people of Israel." That statement in uh, verse 33, you shall not pollute the land in which you live, for blood pollutes the land, is a statement of the value of human life. It's a statement that God does not endorse murder in any way. Now, when we look at that and we think about Christ today, we have to realize that that we should be extremely thankful. Now, not that you're going out and committing murder or being a manslayer or any of that kind of stuff, but at the same time, when we think about sin and we understand the full effects of sin, sin brings about death. Christ satisfied that debt that we couldn't pay when He died on the cross, and then when He resurrected again, He promised new life, life that we have not experienced yet, but we experience the forgiveness and grace from, from Him dying and rising again. So we see a, a, an example here of uh, what we term as, um, uh, we see an example of these refuge cities 
which is the refuge we can find in Christ. But then we also see when the high priest dies that their sin is actually paid, which is what happened when Christ died on the cross. Now, we brought up a moment ago, someone brought up a moment ago about the condition of the heart. So I want to go, if you would, flip over to Matthew chapter 5. By the way, these, uh, as defined by what we read in chapter 35, do these refuge cities still exist today? Not the ones Don was talking about. But do these type of refuge cities still exist today? Wherever. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, would God desire for them to exist today? Is there a need for them to exist today? No, because Christ fulfilled this, right? So there's not a need for the refuge city to exist. Now, whether they do in a Jewish culture, I'm not sure of on that either. But there's not a need for them to exist today because Christ is the one that came and, and done fulfilled this part of what we might term the law. Now if you look in Matthew chapter 5 you find Christ teaching. We refer to it many times as the Sermon on the Mount. And in that we find starting in verse 21 Christ speaks to anger. Notice what verse 21 says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come offer your gift." Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now when we think about that last statement, you will never get out until you paid the last penny. Realize that from a, a, a spiritual standpoint, we will never escape the spiritual bondage until the last penny of our debt is actually paid. That is through Jesus Christ. He's paid it. We just have to accept it from it. But until we accept it, then that debt has not been paid. And we are still indebted. And that indebtedness lasts forever until we ask for Christ's forgiveness and salvation. So, there's an importance for us to understand, and I hope you, I think you all would say this and agree with it. There's an importance for us to understand that people need Christ in their life. They need to understand that there is a need for salvation. There's a, a debt that couldn't be paid that had to be paid by a sacrifice, but it had to be the perfect sacrifice because these priests dying in Old Testament didn't fulfill it for everyone on the face of the earth. Only the perfect sacrifice could do that. These priests were not perfect. So there's a need for everyone to understand that they have a need for Christ. How, and I asked this question to our class this morning, how do we get people to understand that they have a need for Jesus Christ in their life? Yeah. So we are the messengers, so to speak. And we have an obligation to go and to share. But we can't make them understand that they need it. There is a drawing that has to occur by the Spirit, but there's also the realization, which we would say would be in that same. There has to be a realization, too, that they have a need of it. What about someone who doesn't believe in the Bible. Is there any way that we can facilitate 
for them to have the understanding that they need something such as a Savior in their life. Yeah. Right. Right. That's right. There has to be that realization of the need. somebody to the Bible, they have to be introduced to Christ. Or if that's heaven, you have to go. If you're not willing to go, God will raise up rocks to do it. So mm-hmm. we, we're called to go. There was, uh, you might remember in, uh, in New Testament, there was a time where Christ told uh, the apostles to go in the cities. And if they would not accept, I'm paraphrasing, but if they would not accept them, you remember what they told them, what He told them to do on leaving the city? Shake the dust off. What did that mean? How do we feel about that? Yeah, because in our mind we may be thinking of the context of people out in society that we may not know, but we want to tell them about this. But what about when it's your brother or your sister? I'm talking about biologically. Your brother or your sister and they don't want to hear it. You have to remember that Jesus Christ didn't, wasn't able to reach everyone. He sat with the rich man and talked to the rich man. The rich man still refused and that was Christ. Right. So we won't be able to reach everyone. Right. But we can try. Yeah, and our, our responsibility is not for them to accept it however much we want them to. But our responsibility is to, to share or to go and make sure they've heard. But then once they hear, um, it comes down to what they decide to do. But that's a, that's a hard thing for us to do. And w- when we think about it in the context of, well, there's, there's people in name whatever country you want to that need to be told about Christ. And we think about that context and, and we don't have the emotional tie or attachment to them. But when we think about it being a family member that maybe grew up in the same household you did, then it becomes a little bit harder for us to think about that. Yeah. And I don't know that we would want it to go away. I don't think. Because if, if it does, then we lose. We don't want to give up. Yeah, because prayer prayer plays an important part in this as well. That we pray for their eyes to be open in some way. Pray that maybe God reveals them in a way that they would see. Now we know God reveals Himself still today, but we pray that their eyes would be open to Him revealing Himself. You need to look at every opportunity you can to spend time with that individual. We got to make sure we're spending time that points them to Christ too, right? Yeah. What about if it? I think you have to also realize that sometimes you're not meant to be the one to bring them to Christ. I mean, you can want it for them all you want 
to, but sometimes the prayer has to change to let somebody else enter their life that would lead them to Christ, and then hopefully, you know, you can reconcile later, but I mean, that's, I think sometimes we put that burden on ourselves and carry that very heavily when so, we got to give it to Christ, that God has a plan, and sometimes you're not the one that's supposed to uh, impact on certain Christ. Sometimes we're the sower, sometimes we're the water, Someone else reaps the benefit of maybe work that's been done. In order to stay encouraged when you are witnessing the loss, intentionally going out of your way to do it, is you have to think about it as you have a a hundred percent success rate as long as you're willing to share the gospel. Now that doesn't mean you can't get better at it. It doesn't mean you can't shake off the nerves a little easier the next time you go out, you know, and kind of learn from well this seems to work better than this or whatever, but you ever think oh, I failed in that moment it's hard to get up and do it again but if you know it's like what they're saying the, you know Paul planted the seed Apollo slaughtered and God gave the increase no matter where you're at on that line as long as you give them the minimum basics of what the gospel is and that's that Christ died for their sins God can use that in all kinds of ways but you can't be discouraged just because you've maybe never had somebody who you presented the gospel to it, then they broke down in tears and gave you a big hug, and there was this big moment. It may just be walking down through Walmart, somebody say something, you spout something off for uh, about the gospel, and then never see that person again, and they may go on and spread the gospel to China or something. You know, you, you don't know, but you have to understand that you, as long as you're doing what God's called you to do, you have a hundred percent success rate. There's much that has to be said about the leading of the Holy Spirit in those situations too. And if, if we feel the call to say something at some point in time to, to one of these individuals, no matter where it may be, uh, we have to be obedient to that. Um, but we cannot let ourselves become downtrodden just because an individual that we've tried for years to reach out to will not accept. Because it is their choice. When you look at those that were, you know, in, in going back to our, our discussion out of chapter 35, um, those who committed manslaughter had the obligation to go to the refuge city. If they wouldn't go to the refuge city, they didn't find refuge and they wouldn't be saved. And the avenger could kill them and there was nothing they could do about it. They had the responsibility to go to that city in the same way that people today who are seeking refuge today have the responsibility to turn to Christ if they know about it. It's one of the things. These cities were scattered throughout the promised land and they were available and it was to be known by all that they were available for them to go to. But they still had to pack up their stuff quickly and go. People today Maybe we don't realize that um, the importance of the timeliness of turning and going to Christ. But it is our responsibility to know that we need to go to that place of refuge. And without going there, then we're not going to find that refuge. I thought it was Chase at first. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right, any last questions or comments? She's getting ready for school, isn't she? All right. I uh, would encourage you. I know sometimes Old Testament, especially when you get into like Numbers, Leviticus, those kind of things are hard. But it's been preserved for us for a reason. And many times it points us back to Christ and underst a deeper understanding of why Christ came and what He did and the purpose that He still serves in our life today. So I would encourage you, don't shy away from the Old Testament when it terms to study, but take a look at it. And sometimes you need help getting through some of those things, but it's valuable and it's worth your time to do. You all stand together. Let's uh, be dismissed in a word of prayer tonight.
Brother Donnie, do you care to close this in prayer? Thank you, Lord, for the day that I remember I ran to you. Lord, as a teenager, I didn't really understand a lot about it, but I knew I needed a Savior, and I thank you for what that has meant to me and my family, and how that hiding in Christ has prepared me for eternity. And I'm grateful, Lord, for your sacrifice that um, gives us this relationship with you. Thank you for loving us and continuing to show us mercy and grace every day. And Lord, I pray that you lead us this week, give us the opportunity, help us to be paying attention, give us opportunities that come, and uh, help us to speak up for your Holy Spirit's leading. Give us a good week, help us to have good attitudes as we go into it, and, and give you praise for all that we see. Love you and we pray in Jesus' name. One last thing before you go. Remember, homecoming next week. If you have any um, old photos or items concerning the church, whether it be during the construction phases of the church, whatever it may be, if you have anything that you wouldn't mind to loan to the church for us to display during homecoming, if you would bring it by Wednesday night or bring it to Wednesday night, and we'll have it on display for homecoming. All right. Thank you all. Y'all have a wonderful week.